Hello, and thank you for joining another episode of Environmental Coffee House. My name is Antonio Reed, and we'll also be joined today with Jennifer Hines. She's the Arctic. Uh, uh, she, excuse me. She's the author of the Methane Monster and the Demise of the Arctic. So she'll be here to talk to us about um, our this show's latest edition, uh, which will focus on the new report that was released by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, the new report that was released by the IPCC was titled The Climate and the Land, okay? So this report will be looking at the different interactions the climate has uh, with the land and of course how the land interacts with the climate as well. Um, so I'm gonna begin today's show with uh, kind of a prologue. Uh, I think it's very important as we develop a narrative on climate change that we give detail and understanding and, and, and a type of historical analysis uh, in our narrative. Um, because after all, history is the story that we tell ourselves about ourselves. So our story begins roughly in 1750 through about 1830. This period was known as the Industrial Revolution. Uh, what happens, particularly in this period, is that Europe and the United States began to use coal, oil, and gas to create energy. Um, so during this period, we see large changes in uh, textile manufacturing and distributing, uh, steam power, iron making, and mechanical tools. Okay, So that is why this period will be essentially uh, term the Industrial Revolution because we start to see uh, changes in those prospects. Um, and this is happening from 1750 on up to the present day. We're just living in a reiteration and evolution of the Industrial Revolution. Um, so it's important to know as we talk about climate change, for example, uh, and uh, you know baselines for temperature change, the Industrial Revolution, so, so you can add a little bit more to, I guess, your jargon. So when we talk about uh, baseline change, just, we're talking about a period uh, from 1750 to about 1830. Anytime we talk about a baseline, we're not talking about one single year. We're talking about uh, a decadal average, uh, in, at least, okay? So the decades that we use to do the baseline here is not 1750, it's about 1750 to 1830. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Changes uh, uses the 1880 to 1920 baseline, for example, okay? Um, so we're in the midst of the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution enables the human population to finally break through and beyond 1 billion people around the planet. Before the advent of industrial civilization, humans had only achieved numbers of roughly around a billion around the world. Um, but during the Industrial Revolution, um, humans are able to really begin to consume resources at an unprecedented scale. And we were able to industrialize agriculture. And that's essentially where our topic in the IPCC report for today's discussion will go, is to talk about the changes in land use and agriculture and its impacts on our climate. Mm -hmm. Today, um, we're looking at a situation that is, is obviously uh, indicative of a crisis. We saw historic wildfires in the United States uh, and California last year. Um, the estimates coming uh, so far uh, say that we saw as much emission from the California wildfires as we did from the entire state of California uh, in one year. And what they tell us today is as we're witnessing the wildfires in Siberia, we see 20 times the size of the wildfire, the historic wildfire last year in California. Um, but before we get in, into uh, that discussion, um, I wanted to invite Jennifer to say something, a little bit about something about uh, this period, particularly in the post-war period, uh, where industrial <clears throat> civilization meets up with the advent of um, the nuclear industry 
and the Green Revolution. And this is the, you know, it's, it's, it's coined the Anthropocene. Can you say a little bit mm -hmm. about uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, they they do say that the uh, anth anth you know this is a word that was in invented by a man. Can you really say it like Anthropocene? Is that it? I mean, it's it's such a difficult word to say. But they say that that is basically our new age, and it's happening so quickly, especially since like 1950. In about 1950, if you look at several, like maybe 20 different, I saw a chart recently and it was just startling and how much change has happened to our world since 1950. That's when this new um, kind of like hockey stick really started to take shape in earnest because there was a, you know, since 1750, you know, which is basically 200 years before that, there was a ramp up, but it was gradual. After World War II and that recovery period and the great addiction to oil and all of our crazy ingenuity and you know shipping around the world and globalization, everything is exponentiating so, so quickly. And that's the scary thing is because you see what's happening so, clearly in so many different measures and it's always going straight up. So what we're seeing now is actually, anybody can see this now, it's not like hidden at all. And there's a great change in just about everything. And I was noticing on MSNBC, I was watching it the other day and they did this whole thing about uh, uh, food and 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 food resources and and food crises uh, due to climate change and MSNBC I must say is really being on top of a lot of things. I, I have to say I'm kind of a big fan of a lot of the stuff that they do because they are starting to really support climate change and expose it as truth. But I guess that's the main thing, Antonio. What we're doing right here you and I here today in Environmental Coffee House is that we're speaking truth and we're not speaking truth that happened, you know, starting 2016, this IPCC report that you just mentioned. It took three years to put it out. That information is three years old and it's huge. So maybe the IPCC report, it, it's used for something else. I don't know, but I mean, I can't read it. I, I tried to read chapter two and it was just like startlingly difficult to read. And it didn't even really mention any methane feedback in chapter two, which was this land and climate chapter until page 74 out of 185 pages. And I'm like, oh my God, this is like so difficult to read it, you know? So, you know, here we are, we're in an age where everything is becoming unglued pretty quickly. Everything's exponentiating. Everything's speeding up in every single sector and everybody can feel it. And we're entering into an unknown time. And, you know, we're just gonna have to see you know, what it looks like. What do you think? Well, and that's, I think that's exactly right because the Anthropocene, one of its characteristics is this explosion in resource use and population and water and land uh, degradation and CO2 emission into the atmosphere uh, as a result of an explosion of industry. And 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 that's, that's where, I guess, you know, throughout the IPCC's history, it doesn't even begin to, to come together until 1990s when they released their first report, right? Uh, the AR1, and that's when they first mm -hmm. concluded that uh, climate change was happening and that uh, humans were the cause. Um, but but think about that in the in the you know 30 plus years of IPCC, this is their first report that they're really focusing on uh, land changes. Okay, and like you say, they're they're still not talking about um, permafrost emissions, um, terrestrial and subsea. Um, but, but, but what this report does, and I guess I am a little bit appreciative about is, is it makes it, 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 it finally in 2019, uh, it gets to the point where we can talk about, uh, 
this a little bit more holistically than literally just like emissions out of the tailpipe of your car or emissions from um, your air conditioning unit or something like that. But really emissions uh, encompass every aspect of our life and something that's going on in your life right now around you is causing emission. And, 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 and one way that, that emissions are being caused the report reflects on is that uh, the way that we produce distribute and consume food. Mm -hmm. Now this, this is vitally important um, because this radically changes during the Anthropocene. This radically changes in the 1950s to the 1960s when we go through the Green Revolution, uh, which is kind of interesting because there's nothing green about the Green Revolution. Uh, this is a, a, a market mad dash uh, deployment of chemical fertilizer, agrochemicals, controlled water, uh, and industrial uh, uh, meat production. So this is this is this is all but green, other than than the fact that that the actual crops are green. Um, but what happens is is the industrial revolution, the powering of fossil fuels, enables this industrial global agriculture. And right now, it's estimated that five hundred thousand square miles of land surface area has been converted. Uh, from forest to 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 uh, agricultural land, so so we're talking about there's enough farmland in the world it equals the size of the South American continent. So that's impressive, by the way, uh, that humanity has been able to do something like that. But if you do something like that, what will happen? What will happen? Well. You won't have any trees. You won't have any, you know, the animals that live in the forests will all go away. They won't be there anymore. You're wiping out whole sectors of the ecosystem. Um, and your oxygen is going to go down because trees um, suck in the carbon dioxide and cleanse it. They also emit water and give a more gentle climate. They also actually absorb energy itself like like if you have trees it becomes much cooler all that sucking in of carbon dioxide and digesting it actually is a cooling effect and some trees like pine trees emit kind of like cooling things so it's it's a feedback that basically leads to heat and desertification um, very quickly because once they remove those trees and grow whatever needs to be grown there, probably like soybeans to feed cows, I would guess, which it seems weird, or whatever they feed those cows, uh, corn or something. But in any case, you know, that's just another feedback. And, and one, one thing that really kind of scares me on some of these graphs, speaking of graphs, is watching the O2 go down. Like, so that's another feedback. So, you know, we are all familiar with the feedbacks, you know, and, and the exponentiation that goes up, but there's also another type of exponi exponentiation that goes down. And um, oxygen is one of those. And every year, just through what we do to the atmosphere, um, how we burn it, how we abuse it, and how many trees we cut down, we're having less and less oxygen on and, Earth. And, and what's interesting is, 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 you know, IPCC looks at in their report, you know, why are we doing this? Why are we cutting down huge swaths of forest? And it's mainly to produce meat agriculture. Um, mm -hmm. this, is, this is something that's specifically a demand of Western countries, uh, which is, is part of the impact focus here, is that what's happened is essentially uh, the global south has leased off its lands to produce the meat for the global north. Uh, and particularly the United States, uh, Americans eat uh, absurdly uh, uh, high amounts of meat in their diet. Um, you know, some people eat meat at least three times a day uh, with uh, their breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, but this has a huge toll on the planet. So, so all the uh, impact that you just mentioned onto terrestrial ecosystems, uh, stripping down the forests in the Amazon, 
uh, what does it say? They lose a, a, a football size, football field size of the Amazon every three hours or something of that nature. Um, all of this is done in the name of producing for the civilization. Um, and there are more exchanges that the land has. Uh, you're just mentioning quite, quite uh, a few of them. Um, but another thing is as we degrade the soils, the soils themselves are able to store less carbon uh, and to uptake less carbon. And so that in itself is a feedback uh, with this rapid industrial agricultural uh, farming that's occurred all over the world. Um, but another uh, you know, impact that you're talking about is that forests help regulate the climate itself. It creates climates or microclimates. Um, and sometimes these microclimates uh, stretch over uh, huge regions like the Amazon. Um, so these are going to have uh, huge effects. But, but let me also say this about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, you know, they, they talk about this, but it almost gives me the sense, first of all, we got to know why they're, they're focusing on land, okay? So this is kind of, you know, uh, coming off of the back of the Intergovernmental Panel report, or Special Report on 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, and this one is focusing specifically on land changes. And the reason why is because of the so-called high uh, ambitions group. Uh, so these are just small island countries and things of that nature. Uh, these are the people who have the most to lose the soonest. And so they, they push the IPCC to do its special report on 1.5, and they push the IPCC to do this report on land uh, uh, changes and uses. And I think that that's happened as a response to the realization almost. Now, I do think it's, it's good. It's, it's not, it's dynamic, right? So I think in part, it's a response to the fact that um, energy sector emissions, it, it, we've not budged on this. Um, since the IPCC released its first report in 1990, emissions are, are nine or 65 percent higher uh, than they were in 1990. Uh, our energy sector's emissions have not declined. I mean, neither have the agriculture for that matter. Um, but more focus has been put on the agriculture because maybe there's a hope that uh, maybe if we can't, uh, you know, change our energy sector and our energy generation sectors, maybe we can change our cultural sectors. Um, because after all, the agricultural sector uh, is, is responsible for uh, a third of, of global emissions um, for several different factors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's, it's absolutely stunning. And it's, it's amazing. It's just really more out of habit than anything else. Um, but there are meat al alternatives that are perfectly good and we probably should be you know shifting over to those and eating less and less if we're not vegetarian then um try and substitute a couple of meat alternatives because the thing is if you participate in it you say well i can't really do much i'm just one person it's not really going to matter because i'm just one person and so i'm just going to do whatever but then it's your participation in something that gives it life. So if you don't participate in it and then more people choose not to participate in something, your non-participation is a rebellion in itself. And that will actually change the demand. Is it realistic that enough people are gonna change that? I don't know, I'm not sure. Well, part of part of the point that I think IPCC tries to make is there has to be a cultural change. But mm -hmm. cultural changes, I mean, we're really asking ourselves uh, very fundamental questions about our society. And, and one of those questions in tackling this issue is where does the culture change start? Does it start with individuals? Does it start with communities? Does it start with the government? Um, does it start with policy? Um, and I think it, it starts everywhere all at the same time. Maybe the e immediate precipice is in individuals, but individuals are staffing institutions. They're, they're staffing communities and things of this nature. Uh, and so they try to pursue their own agendas. So with that being said, I think it is important for people to make that their agenda. 
make it your agenda to realize first of all there's first of all there's immediate health benefits you do not have to eat meat uh three times a day um in fact that's unhealthy for you for a number of different reasons uh, and, and plus this is the, <laughs> the meat that we're eating today is is, is, is is mostly chemicals and hormones and a bunch of things that we'll talk about on, a, on, on our next show um, that they really aren't good for you. So you want to limit that anyways. Uh, but beyond that, um, people just have misconceptions. You simply don't have to have burger and steak as part of your, your, your meal. Uh, you don't. In, in fact, that's what the report talks about is actually taking out beef alone, uh, beef and lamb particularly, would have a tremendous impact. So maybe that's something that you can do in your life. Only have beef twice a month. Okay, as opposed to where you already are, um, and then substitute that with turkey or substitute that with chicken or something like that, uh, and you will have significant uh, emissions reductions. Um, and, and, and the reason why is because, first of all, cattle uh, uh, require more land, they require more water, uh, they require more uh, energy to process, and also the amount of methane that cattle put into the atmosphere itself. Um, so there, there, there are opportunities where um, individuals can make can come together to make collective differences. Uh, and I think that's that's part of this challenge in climate change is we live in this culture where it says nonsensically pull yourself up by the bootstrap and, you know, rugged individualism. But in fact, it's not rugged individualism that's going to see us through. It's going to be a type of collective conscience. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And and that's what's kind of exciting about the time that we live in. I mean, it's horrible, but it's also kind of amazing. And we are participating in an awakening and a change in attitude and a change in knowledge and understanding of, of what's real. And what I see is that... Um, this this understanding that we all share about the state of our planet and everything going on with it because we exchange so much information in our social networks right so we're all kind of like primed up but that actually that echo chamber is breaking and um people in general the these understandings of where we're at is actually getting into the mainstream more and more. Um, you know, Christian ministers are speaking about it in their in their sermons. Uh, comedians are speaking about it in their stand-up acts. Um, you know, it's everyday people are starting to understand that this is the biggest show on earth right now. And, and it really is happening everywhere at once. Uh, before I go through kind of a, a discussion of what's been happening, I want to give people the power or at least the insight on, because the question has been asked, what can we do personally? Um, and, and I think we're trying to tackle that here. There's so many things you can personally do. Um, but one of the things that you can directly do is just limit the amount of meat you personally eat in your family. If 15 people who are watching right now did exactly that. Um, that's going to represent almost a hundred people if, if you're talking about their families um, in extended families. Um, that would have a huge impact on the amount of beef that needs to be produced. And think about that as as this conversation takes off, like the climate change conversation is taking off, the people really start linking, oh my God, my eating a burger is directly related to that chaos wildfire happening in the Siberia Arctic. If that type of fire really scares me, or like the fires in California, or like the hurricane that hit Harvey, or excuse me, the uh, uh, Harvey, the hurricane that hit Houston, or um, Katrina, or Sandy, or all these other small events that, that we've been mentioning, well, they're not actually small, they're, they're incredible events that have been happening around the world. Uh, that maybe don't get so much media attention. If you really are fearful of that happening, you can directly link your lifestyle to it. And so you are going to have to make um, lifestyle and cultural changes if you want to mitigate your impact on the climate. And that's a hard ask for people to do. 
because you have a commercial market that wants you to consume like a maniac to no end. Um, and so that's been cultural, that's, that's been endowed in our culture that um, having a nicer, bigger house, having newer shoes or a nicer car or, or having the latest iPhone uh, and, and this kind of consumer oriented life that we have, but there are measurable impacts to every ounce of that life. Um, and, and, and here the IPCC focuses on the food you eat. And that's just one impact you have. Um, if you're a person that eats beef and lamb, you are disproportionately having a, a burden on the atmosphere um, because it takes an extreme amount of energy uh, to do that. And not only that, people have to understand when we're developing uh, this process, so, you know, everybody's heard about the corn that grows in the United States. Well, most of the corn in the United States is used as feed, right? So these are huge amounts of land that have been dedicated to feed. Um, and think about that whole process. Think about how much chemical fertilizer and agrochemicals have to be produced. And think about how much fossil fuels you need to produce those fertilizers. And then you have to distribute those fertilizers. And then you actually have to deploy those fertilizers. It's an incredibly energy intensive process. And this is just to feed the livestock who in and themselves have a, another portfolio of uh, ecological, environmental, and atmospheric impact so that you can have a burger. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna get I mean, burger. when you put it like that, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> oh, it is daunting. It is daunting. And, you know, this is just like typical of the civilization that we find ourselves in. It's like ridiculous in the absurd. If, when you put it like that and you're like, OK, so first you chop down the trees and you kill all the animals and then you grow up some corn and then you harvest it and then you feed it in here and it poops and it makes methane and all that stuff. And then you kill it and you grind it up and then you eat it. It just doesn't make sense. <laughs> you know, what's you know what I mean? This is that, that there's also a reference to an understanding of native cultures uh, and more indigenous uh, peoples is that they actually do, while they lack the scientific vernacular to express this, they do have those type of understandings that, that they impact, that they're living their lifestyle impacts um, the land and it impacts nature. Um, for us in the West, our actions are totally disconnected from um, um, the impacts onto nature. And so for us, it does seem like an absurdity to talk about uh, how having a burger leads to, you know, world ending emissions uh, uh, because, because they're so detached from one another. You, you don't, you've never seen the animal that you're eating. Um, you've never seen the process which it takes to turn that animal into raw meat. Uh, you, you don't you don't really think about that. Uh, what you think about is the the, the smells, the taste, uh, and the satisfaction of having that final product that's actually been in a very long line of processes to get to you. Um, but but we're going to exactly have to tackle that that way of thinking. Um, we're going to have to unglobalize the world in that respect. Um, and one thing that we see from the what, what's happening, which is even you know more alarming, is that as countries um, develop, as countries get rich, um, they start craving more and more of these meat diets, these meat heavy diets. And so, are we going to? So, so basically, right now, the land use crises <laughs> that we have around the world is mainly the fault of 320 million Americans. 580 million Europeans. And now we're going to add, um, used to be uh, rice and noodle eating India and China uh, to the burger menus as well. <laughs> yes, well, it's, it's sad, isn't it? And and people's diet is changing. They, you know, as, as people leave the third world behind and embrace all the, you know, characteristics of, of the first world, you know, everybody wants to get there, you know, you got to get your car, 
And then you got to start eating, you know, burgers and, and they do their, their diet changes a lot. And that's just part of um, transitioning out of the third world into the first world. So in that, that goes to tackle this whole question too, of, you know, what can you do? And, and one of the big solutions that people have is, uh, you know, we're going to force the world, a forestation. Well, well, there's only so much land. You got to remember only 25% of the surface is, is, is terrestrial. Uh, most of it is ocean. Um, so, you know, we shouldn't have named it uh, earth. We should have named it ocean. Um, yeah. but, but of this land, okay, it's not an infinite amount. If you're going to do what we're doing, we already have an area the size of South America dedicated solely to farmland, agricultural use. OK, um, you can't really replicate that too many more times. OK, no, and, well, and the we're, 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 this is the meaning of overshot overshoot. You know, we we have overextended ourselves and we actually already kind of like <clears throat> jumped off the bridge, but we haven't noticed that we're dropping. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of like it hasn't dawned on us that we're actually in the process of this slippery side of the slope. And, um, you know, I think they're going to keep that charade up as long as possible. I was on um, Sam Mitchell's Collapse Chronicle. And one of the things that I, I mentioned there was that the collapse process is probably already underway. And the reason why that is is because collapse does this. OK, it arcs, but the collapse doesn't start on the other side of the arc, on the downward mm -hmm. side of the arc. The collapse starts on the upward side of the arc. The mm -hmm. pressures of collapse build, they equal the expansion itself. And then that's when you begin to have a radical decline. OK. All right. So so we are already seeing that. Uh, in, in talking about the wildfires and talking about the ocean heat waves and talking about, look at what happened in Greenland just recently. We saw an entire year's worth of melt occur in a single day uh, in Greenland. And that was just two days ago. So we're, we're <laughs> so, so we're, we're, we're there. It's melting down. And the pressures are, are building monumentally. I mean, that's what we're talking about, relating these pressures to each other. So when you engage in an act of civilizational defiance, um, you are easing the pressure on the planet, okay? So think about your burgers like that. Think about your next iPhone like that. Think about uh, the next time you're, you're using lights irresponsibly, you're every aspect of your life. In every aspect and everything that you do, think about it as releasing a little bit of pressure on the planet. And at the same time, hundreds of millions of more people are quadrupling their pressures on the planet. <laughs> oh, it just makes me sick to think about it. <laughs> because, yeah, I mean, we all kind of, those of us who are very much engaged in this, we try and get ourselves into easing the pressure. Like I just got, you know, I mentioned solar panels and I'm just loving them. And I'm like, oh my God, these things are going to last well, for probably till the end of time, you know, to the end of civilization. And this house is now carbon neutral. So at that level, I'm not participating in the oil company because it's a hundred percent offset. So I'm enjoying that. You know, we kind of like fine tune all these different choices that we do. We kind of get into it a little bit. It's like, oh, you know, I could do, do this. So that's us. And then you just see the hordes and the masses embracing exactly the opposite. It's a little bit kind of defeating, right? Well, it's it's because you know to me it's almost it's almost biblical in the in in the type of language you might want to speak of it as um, you know there is there's no righteous one among you that that we've all kind of been given up yeah. to our own way of 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 industrial convenience right. Um, 
you know, you talk about 60 years ago, people were not eating nearly as much meat as they are today because you simply couldn't afford to do so because there wasn't the industrial technology to do that for you. Um, and so we really in the United States have put on a diet that's first of all, unreal and extremely unhealthy. That's why we have such outrageous rates of uh, diabetes uh, uh, and, and a number of different uh, other uh, dietary related health issues um, because of, of this explosion of, of access, easy access to uh, what used to be expensive and still very much is intensively made food. Um, so so as we're, we're kind of seeing this all kind of play out uh, and watching, you know, countries just, just grappling for this. Another problem uh, that the IPCC talks about and, and what we talk about here is water. You know, mm -hmm. um, I was just reading an article recently that day tw day zero, day zero is the day that you run out of drinkable water. <laughs> 11 cities, major cities around the world um, are going to hit day zero next year. Oh my God. Have we had a city that's hit day zero yet? Has that actually ever happened in a major city for real yet? Like, did day zero happen already somewhere? I'm going to have to follow back up with you on that one. But I was just reading in. Because we got so close. I remember the different droughts that happened, you know, Sao Paulo and Cape Town. And these really major, major cities were running out of water. And I think at the last, they were saved by rains. But you're saying how many 11, cities? Are 11 major cities. Uh, oh, my God. Do you know which do you happen to remember any of them? Um, I will definitely them? post them into our environmental coffee house link. Um, oh my God. <laughs> That's crazy. Bless you. Um, yeah, I, I, I was focusing mainly on the on the IPCC report, so I forgot the names, and, and they're kind of, some of them were hard to pronounce because they're international oh. names as well. Um, but that's one of the things that the IPCC focuses on is that land masses and continents everywhere um, where there's human development or will be facing massive water shortages by 2030. Um, oh so we're, we're talking about a situation um, where there will be enough drinkable water for only 60% of the population on a daily basis by 2030. So 40% of the human population by 2030 <sighs> will not have access to drinkable water by 2030. I mean, I just we're- can't even comprehend that. It's amazing, it's, it's horrible. I mean, I mean, what's going to happen? Well, well, uh, I, I think look at what's happening already. It's, it's just going to keep on extrapolating out. Uh, what are we seeing across the equatorial regions around the world? The equatorial regions around the world, first of all, um, are, 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 are you know, naturally very warm areas. But just a little bit of warmth changes the entire dynamics of the tropics, um, and particularly for you know several things. Uh, humans have a wet bulb temperature of 95 degrees and 100 percent humidity. So as the planet slowly warms, as the tropics slowly warm, which is not so slow uh, as we see, uh, humans are going to get to the point where their own personal water demands will be extremely high. And if they don't meet those demands, they could suffer uh, organ failure, heart attack or heat stroke within hours of exposure. Uh, to these type of conditions, um, and 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 this is this is by the way uh, is going to do for the richer countries in 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 the equatorial regions. What's it's going to have a feedback? The first feedback in the richer countries like India is that those who are able to uh, build air conditioners or have air conditioners will rapidly do that. So we're going to talk about a rapid deployment of air conditioners across uh, the BRICS nations. Uh, those, right. Um, the fast mid developing countries. And for those who are poor, they will either die in the street or move north. Uh, it's just going to be chaos. And it's already happening, though. We're already seeing this. We're already seeing these perturbations throughout our society. Um, and that's, that's the part that people do have to be conscious of. Climate change is not a future event, climate change no. is an era. We are in the era of climate change. It's not like the movie showing happening at eight o'clock on Sunday morning. <laughs> yeah. It, it's happening now and it's ramping up.
It is ramping up. It's so scary. And we should probably talk about the water crisis in India, too, and how the headwaters of all those major rivers going down to India, most of them originate in China. And China holds the keys to a lot of those rivers. And I heard there's been uh, 600 hydro dams that have been put up in the headwaters of the Himalayas and those regions in China. Can you can you talk about that a little bit? So the Chinese have engaged um, in a huge public works program. And part of that public works program, first of all, the entire Chinese uh, Eastern land mass is basically uh, being, being turned into concrete by the building of their cities uh, and hyper urbanization. And to meet the challenges of hyper urbanization, the Chinese are going to have to extract immense amounts of water. And in so doing, they are engaged in these projects of building levees, canals, and dams. Uh, and, and yes, they are on, on task now to build 600 dams. Now, these dams, like you say, hold the keys uh, to the water resources of countries throughout Indochina, countries uh, such as India and Pakistan. Um, we've already seen war and conflict pressing uh, in the Kashmir region of India and Pakistan. Now, um, we're mm -hmm. really threatening uh, global stability uh, due to a water crisis. And of course, the Himalayans at the same time are rapidly losing uh, glaciers due to climate change. Um, yeah. So the Indian population is looking at almost a population of 150 million people by 2030 who could be about drinkable water. Um, and we see uh, a similar size proportion happening in Pakistan, okay? Now these are all three, and I, I have you know this, that these are all three nuclear armed states, okay? So this is not a, 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 a small fight in the African Sahara. This is no. uh, huge populations um, having no access to, to water and nuclear armed. What could go wrong? So we'll, we'll, see, we'll see. We're we're ten years out. We're ten years out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and you know, you know what else is accelerating, Antonio? Um, we we don't generally think of this as an immediate thing because it's such a slow thing. But sea level rise okay. is accelerating, and we might want to kind of talk a little bit about the pressures of sea level rise, and also talk about that was such an interesting thing that you told me right before this um, show started today, you were talking about these inland seas that have been manifesting suddenly in the strangest areas. And I was just like kind of horrified. This is sort of like a new phenomenon that I hadn't really heard too much about. But, but I, I kind of want to mention before we get into that sea level rise, you know, where, this, where the land is already very, very flat, it doesn't really take very much to inundate all of that and to put a lot of um, salt water into natural fresh water reserves, you know, however they are, whether they're underground or, or in reservoirs or whatever. So, for example, <clears throat> since we've been talking about China and India and, and water issues, well, Bangladesh is very much at sea level and it's basically kind of a marsh. I mean, a lot of it is, is, is very flat and very marshy and they lose so much land in Bangladesh every single year due to the encroaching ocean that's just kind of unrelenting going and going and going. Those people first run to Dhaka, the capital, and then, you know, I mean, the whole country's starting to feel these pressures. And India, I believe, has put up a lot of barriers. Well, you know, like the U.S. has has barriers, right, you know, on the Mexican border or starting to or whatever. Um, you know, the same goes goes in India. Well, those those Bangladeshi people don't really have anywhere to go. I mean, their land is going underwater and there's not like any, I mean, these people who, these farmers who had been prosperous for, you know, who knows, 10 generations, this is their family plot of incredibly fertile 
um, high yield land. I mean, this was their culture. This was their, you know, and then that land, you can see it, it just crumbles away, it crumbles away and they have nowhere to go. And it's, it's the saddest thing. Can you talk about that a little bit? Do you know anything about that? So the report also uh, does talk about sea level rise. And of course that they always undershoot sea level rise, but even at their understanding of sea level rise now, as you see, is that as the sea level rises, um, just as you say, uh, it pushes inland. So what that also does is it causes a lot of saltwater intrusion. So they're ruining their crops and they're ruining, ruining their fresh water supplies. So at a time where droughts and things like that are already, and, and glacier disappearance are already challenging the water supplies, the groundwater supplies are being poisoned by saltwater um, and they're losing land. So these are people who are living on literally a situation that is, is eroding um, from the sea and beneath them uh, all at the same time. Um, but, but just like you were saying a little bit uh, uh, ago was uh, sea level is going to be the most defining, uh, it, it's, People have overlooked sea level rise, and I think that's because they don't really understand the impacts of sea level rise. If you understand the impacts of sea level rise, you would you would very quickly understand that it's much more challenging uh, than temperature. Uh, and, mm -hmm. there, and there are no even gimmick quick fixes like geoengineering that are really going to slow down or have any impact on a decadal scale on, on, on sea level rise. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, were you about to say? Yeah, well, I was just kind of going to bring things into perspective. Most people don't know that from the end of the last ice age until like 8,000 years ago, so say 14,000 to 8,000 years ago, the sea level rose 410 feet. And most people say, oh, they don't even realize that it's already happened. And that, you know, the sea level rising another 230 feet, I think that's what we've got wrapped up with Antarctica and Greenland combined or 250 yeah. feet, something like that. You know, that's like half of what already happened. And that just happened in a couple of thousand years. Melt Pulse 1A was the strongest one. And that one started like 13,000 years ago. And it just suddenly went from like, we're not melting at all. The sea level is totally stable. Everything's going along great to boom, melt pulse 1A. And that's the thing about climate that most people don't know either. It's not a gradual affair. It's not a gentle thing. It's not gonna be like, oh, so we're gonna just gradually go like this. Climate shifts are radical and they are sudden. And we are in the midst of a sudden one right now. It's not so sudden that you see it like all in one day. It's not like a Hollywood movie. But from a geological standpoint, this is incredibly sudden. This is happening at freaking lightning speed. We are like, I think, a thousand times higher than the natural extinction rate going right now. I mean, we are engaged full throttle right here, right now in the sixth extinction. It's happening before our very eyes. And we are the witnesses. And so we have to talk about it here on these shows, you know. And, you know, sea level rise is so pressing because, um, so, so just, just as you're saying, for uh, every vertical foot that sea level increases, it goes 100 feet inland, okay? So you hear people kind of joke it off and say, oh, well, if the sea level is going to rise three feet, I'll step four feet back. Well, if you step four feet back, you would be 396 feet under in the ocean. So, mm -hmm. so stepping, so, that, so, so it, it seems like a joke, but in fact, this is, this is going to, all global coastlines will be changed uh, before I'm 75 years old. All global maps will be wrong. The maps that you see today, that you learned about today in school, all will be wrong uh, before the middle of the century. Um, and in some places, they'll be more drastically wrong than others, particularly around like estuaries, um, places where rivers uh, meet the oceans and things like that, and some low-lined areas like swamplands like Bangladesh, for example, 
are the coast of North Carolina, for example, um, these places will be changed, you know, literally tens of tens of miles inland will be changed. Um, the way that the water, that oceans run on the land will be changed. Um, so this will happen all around the world. The Chinese are estimated to have a population of 300 million people uh, that would be affected by 10 feet of sea level rise. Uh, 300 million people is the size of the United States and China. Okay. Oh my God. That is like incredible. Well, I have been seeing those huge abrupt climate change events often hit like those big um, hurricanes and typhoons hit the South China coast there. And it's just like unbelievable inundation with all kinds of water. And, and that's exactly right. And we've been seeing these phenomena happen all over the world. Uh, we saw uh, just in 2019, just in 2019 alone, um, we saw Australia get rocked, the outback Australia get rocked by a storm that created an inland sea you can see from space. Uh, we saw Mozambique, Africa, a place that's not known at all for cyclone uh, you know, development and things of that nature, saw two category fives create a huge inland sea that just cities literally disappeared overnight. Um, it was horrific. And we're talking about hundreds of miles across um, we saw in Kansas uh, 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 cities underwater, uh, an American Air Force base, military base was underwater, uh, hundreds of miles, hundreds of hundreds, thousands of miles of cropland underwater. Um, these events are increasing in their frequency. Um, we're, we're, we're seeing more and more events being able to drop uh, not inches of rain, but feet of rain. So for policymakers out there who, who, are, who are talking about, you know, how, what are some, uh, you know, making an equitable and just transition through this climate change era, how do you talk about dealing with storms that are producing feet of rain at a time? Um, you know, I, I don't, you know, the, the, to, to talk about that is, do you, how do you, do you capture that amount of water? Uh, that would, that's an absurd amount of water to capture. Um, do you create diversion systems in your city? Um, what do you do? And we saw particularly the Northeastern United States, the amount of rain events have increased by 75%. I know, I saw that. They are getting so much more water there. I mean, they are just getting slammed with rain all the time. Every time I look at the satellite, you know, it's pushing another one of these huge giant bands through and just like swamping that whole northeast area it's it's absolutely incredible and also um let's not forget the midwest the midwest is still underwater the crops have still not grown because it's flooded this is not normal <laughs> we're we're seeing this and i i think that what is happening around the world um, is, is, is first of all, we have to understand that most of the food, uh, the stable crops are grown in the mid-latitudes around the world. And right now, the mid-latitudes, um, if that's in the United States, if that's in Europe, if it's in uh, Eurasia or China, have been devastated. Uh, they've been devastated by immense amounts of rain. They've been devastated by freak heat waves. They've been devastated by wildfires. Um, again, just to highlight what was going on, um, we're in a situation now where the planet is, 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 I think, undergoing the early stages of runaway. Um, and you see that. Um, we were highlighting earlier in the show about the California fire. I just want to emphasize that again. The California fire emitted as much one year of fires emitted as much emission into the atmosphere as the entire economy of California. California is the world's, I forget if it's the fifth or seventh, but it's either the fifth or seventh largest economy in the world. And the Siberian fire is 20 times the size of the fire that was in California last year. And it's getting zero press. And that Siberian <laughs> fire or fires, I mean, it's like, apocalyptic when you say biblical you're absolutely right you don't know what else to say it's like the biggest the biggest ever all that soot 
all that heat, all that carbon dioxide, all that stuff settles on the Arctic. And what does it do? It basically cooks it. Yeah. I mean, basically what's left of the poor Arctic is getting covered with soot. All that soot decreases the albedo and everything is just going away so quickly. Did you hear that Trump has actually asked the Russians if, 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 if we could help to put out those fires because they are so immense. Um, it's, it's, it's really incredible because if you look at where these fires are, there's no road access. There's, there's no, I mean, these, if you send firemen out there, they will be backpacking for days, uh, trying to, 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 to fight this fight. The effort, it would take an, now an international effort uh, almost the scale of Fukushima, Daiichi, or Chernobyl. You know, 800,000 liquidators were deployed to Chernobyl. We would need something like that, and many firemen to deal with these type of fires that are happening in Siberia. Um, they're absolutely, I mean, just to think about how absurd that is. Uh, I can't comprehend it. It's just, it's like so huge and so big and that itself is a feedback i mean what always has yeah. fascinated me about climate science is how everything is connected how everything affects everything else and you change something over here you know through all sorts of interactions you're going to find it happening over on the other side and it amplifies and it affects and it has momentum of, of its own and I think when you say, Anthony, that we are in the early stages of runaway, you you might be right. I mean, this might be it because these fires up in Siberia, they're self-igniting. It is like so hot, it is just like igniting it all by itself. You know, that's like spontaneous ignition. What do you do about spontaneous ignition, you know? And you can tell that it's out of control because uh, even Russian military bases uh, have been caught on tape, literally exploding, uh, because there's how you can't fight these fires. I mean, they're and 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 I mean they're they're so immense. And like I said, I mean we're talking about a situation right now that's going to release 20 times more emission than the fifth or seventh largest economy in the world. So essentially. It, it's like a, this this fire will release something like um, the United States yearly emission into the atmosphere. Um, so so we're really talking about a situation here that that I do think is is slipping into out of control. And as for sea level rise, so look, we're being hit in the high north, we're being hit uh, on the coastlines, we're being hit inland from inland seas and droughts. Um, happening everywhere simultaneously. And this is going to begin to destabilize population centers um, because population centers, they are dependent upon, so you, like you're saying in Bangladesh that people are going to the urban centers. Well, those urban centers are 100% dependent on the countryside. So these people, and, and that's kind of like the cognitive dissonance, right, that people have, is that the countrysides exist to serve the cities, okay? Um, but if the countrysides are flooded and, and farmers are losing work coming to this, and then they come to the city, there's, there's not that initial click. You coming to the city and everybody else in the farmland coming to the city means that there's no one staffing the farmlands, which means eventually there's going to be no food in the city. Um, and this is the realization that many people in the third world are going to have. And as they have that realization, that is when they transcend boundaries and borders. And you're right to point out the Indians are building. You, you know, there's no discussion. There's, the, uh, uh, you know, in the United States, they say build that wall, build that wall. They have built the wall in India and they mounted machine guns. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, the, so other parts Ew. of the world are taking it very seriously. Um, and, yeah, United so and, 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 and and Bangladesh is very populated. I think it's one of the most densely populated countries in the world. Am I right? I think there's like 100 very, very, to 180 million people live in Bangladesh. I mean, we're really talking about situations here 
um, that large, large populations across India, across Indochina, across China, across Pakistan are going to be destabilized because they're going to run out of water and they're going to run out of land and they're going to run out of farmland. Um, and uh, for whatever they don't, the more they run out, the more vicious they're going to be on the forest and on, on the remaining uh, uh, nature reserves and, and natural parts of the world. Um, and that's another feedback to the system. So it's not just climate feedbacks, right? We have to realize as humans, as organisms, we also feed back on the planet. So one of the things we're talking about, air conditioners. Air conditioners are literally one of the worst things you can do in a warming planet. Why? Because people don't understand how air conditioners work. Air conditioners, what they do is they take the hot air out of your house and put it outside of your house and replace it with cold, okay? So when you do that, you warm your outside environment, okay? Paul Beckwith, I think, did a video on this where he's showing mm -hmm. that temperatures were several degrees Celsius warmer because of air-conditioned uh, uh, sites. And so deploying more air conditioners will make it unbearable for people oh uh, in the city. The air conditioner feedback. We hadn't thought about the air conditioner feedback. <laughs> oh my goodness. Mm. So so ways that we're gonna try to, the th and, and, and so it will be another kind of transitional injustice, right? Because as, as the rich world warms, we're gonna try to keep ourselves cool, which will put more emission burden into the atmosphere and not just emission burden, but the actual physical heat into the atmosphere. Uh, and that's what partly contributes to the urban heat island effect. Uh, and to speak about the urban heat island effect, particularly in the third world, um, where the cities are very close together and, you know, there are a lot of asphalt and concrete for miles on end uh, due to the buildings and the streets, those urban areas can be eight to 10 degrees Celsius or warmer. Um, and that's, that's, that's beyond critical in a time when we're already seeing temperatures in some cities are between 100 and 120 degrees. Mm -hmm. Absolutely true. And I guess we should talk about the power of trees and how important it is to plant as many trees as possible because trees themselves, you know, as living beings can cool things down. And I know in Africa, they've planted a band of uh, trees that can take that climate up in the Sahara to try and stop the encroaching Sahara because the Sahara Desert is getting bigger and bigger. So they're planting bands of green, like 1500 miles long and things like that. And people are just going on these massive tree planting efforts and it does so many things and it gets more oxygen into the air and all sorts of things. Trees are life. Well, and, and that's a very important, you know, topic of concern because that would be one of the first rational responses is that, you know, instead of building these carbon suckers, what we can do is literally just deploy trees. Um, but there's a limit to what we can do. OK. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of that limit goes up against directly your diet. And that's the point that I think the IPCC is really making is that we can't do these fantastic things that make people feel good at the end of conversations like this if you eat the way you do. It's in, in some in some respect, it's literally that basic. So some people are are, are uh, moaning and groaning about hearing about solutions, but the solutions right up against exactly the things in your life. So if we're going to talk about planting trees, we also have to talk about uh, dietary changes because where else is the land going to come from? The land to plant trees is where we currently have our farms. Uh, it's currently where we have our crops. And so that give and take is going to have to come with that type of discussion. So for every burger you think you want to eat or for every chicken or for every pig or whatever, um, you're going to have to compare it to I mean, trees you want to have planted to, to, to reduce the impacts of climate change. And we're going to see things like this where we have to make crucial decisions on the coastline. We're going to have to make crucial decisions to give up a lot of the coastal real estate. Okay. That's just something we're going to have to accept. There is no saving it. No, there isn't. And the other thing is those people who are going to be forced to move off of their coastal real estate because of encroaching sea level, they're losing that money. 
Yeah. Right. They're losing that real estate. They, it's not like, well, they can just kind of back up. Well, for one thing, there are people there already. They're going to have to find somewhere else to live, but they're also going to have to reestablish themselves because most people's nest egg is tied up in their real estate and in their mortgage. Right. And if you can't sell that or it just becomes like you lose so much money on it because people have finally started to see, oh, this coastal real estate's not going to be worth much. Well, the insurance companies already know that, don't they? they they've been doing these, these um, studies for years and they know that that coastal real estate is going to have, there's going to be a threshold of consciousness and then all of a sudden it's going to start rolling and it's not going to come back because the idea would have penetrated that this land is going to be underwater. That being said, they're still building crazy things in Miami. <laughs> well, that's the, it's, it's, it's in the, the um, governor of Florida made it, remember, illegal for state workers to, to use the term climate change or sea level rise. And He did. And it's because of that, that very analysis. It's because... He doesn't want anyone to tr trigger the housing crisis in yeah. Florida. And there is a house, there is a real today housing crisis. All Florida real estate on the coast will be uh, inviolable before the middle of the century. Um, that is not a doubt. And I don't even think it's the middle of the century. If you look at the intergovernmental, or if you look at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric uh, Administration's projection for sea level rise, we're talking about 10 feet by the end of the century. Well, the level that's considered to be catastrophic for sea level rise is three feet. And we're going to get that sometime between 2035 and 2045. So, in, I mean, so, so, so that's what we're talking about here. A very short period of time from now, all coastal properties on the eastern seaboard of the United States will be inviolable. In, in, in uh, they will have no economic value. Um, and, and that really should, I mean, how many millions of people live, by the way, on the coast of the Eastern United States? Oh yeah. And usually that real estate is pretty nice too, right? Oh. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about trillions of dollars of, yeah. of real estate law. You know, one of the things that I've got very concerned about is, you know, I told you I live here in North Carolina. Well, the the nuclear uh, planners decided to put a nuclear facility right on Wilmington's coast, which is essentially like Bangladesh. It's essentially like a, a swampland. So, and who thought of that? <laughs> I mean, you you it's I don't know what's you know, but so it's absurd because it's it's so there's what do we do? It takes at least twenty to sixty years to decommission a nuclear facility. And we only have 20 years before we face catastrophic levels of sea rise, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So <laughs> it's unbearable. This whole thing is just like crumbling down so fast. It's unbearable. All we can do is talk about it and make personal choices in our own life and try not to participate in all these goodies, you know, that are so tempting um, and, and make life changes. But that being said, that's not going to change. That's not going to get us out of hell. That's just going to be our personal participation. And we can feel good for not participating in these parts of civilization. But we're seeing it crumble right now. And us participating or not participating, it's important to do. But it's, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Got to put everything in perspective, you know, like, yeah. And the reason why I mentioned that is because, um, or you know, what's happening with the nuclear facility here? First of all, there are other nuclear facilities that are in exactly the same problem. Um, you know, Indian Point. I mean, there's there 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 are like 13 on the coast that that I can imagine in the next 10 years are going to have serious problems. Um, but but I I guess I'm appealing to people's uh, internal activism. Okay, so if you're absolutely. Armed, if you're armed with knowledge, you can engage in that knowledge. You can seek it out for yourself, and then you can be empowered to act on that knowledge. So one of the things that I'm doing now with the knowledge that one of our nuclear facilities in my own home state will be submerged in the water before I'm 45 years old is, <laughs> is I, I am in a daily talks, conversation 
uh, via phone and email with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And I am pushing them to at least acknowledge that we have a crisis on our hand and that we have to begin immediate uh, emergency maneuvers to either decommission the facility or to create water diversion systems around the facility uh, and to the point that we can decommission the facility safely remove all the nuclear material. And oh, good for you. It, it really feels like uh, that I'm the first person who's, who's pushing the, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I didn't think of that. <laughs> it's you like, know. really? You didn't think of that? You didn't think about sea level rise before putting a nuclear facility basically on a swamp and it's at sea level? But that's oh, well. Experience <laughs> because a lot of these facilities were built in the 1970s and 1980s and 90s. And so that was really before we've had good measurements of uh, sea level rise. And before that really became into, you know, firm uh, um, scientific understanding. And so right. when we built these nuclear facilities. Um, here's what we knew. They were cool water reactors, which by the way, it, it's all nuclear facilities, not just the one in North Carolina you need to be worried about, but they're all cool water reactors and cool water reactors have to be located near oceans, rivers, and lakes that have access to water for their uh, cooling systems. Mm -hmm. And um, that means that all of those facilities are exactly the worst places to be if there is a climate warming situation to occur on planet Earth. And it just so happens that there is a climate warming situation occurring on Earth, uh, and all those facilities are exactly in the worst places that they could possibly be, um, because that's where a lot of the inland seas and oceans occur. Is is they occur in part because of the enormous amount of water that's produced in the atmosphere, but also all the runoff. Uh, and these facilities will be close to those runoff areas. <laughs> you, you you know you know what's going to happen here, Antonio. They're all located, all these cool water reactors are all located roughly at the exact same, you know, sea level, right? All yep. around wherever they occur around the world, unless they're on a lake or river or something like that. Well, what that means is they're all going to go dysfunctional at the same time. I mean, how many nuclear facilities do we have on the coast? They're all going to experience massive failure all at the same time when the ocean goes up like, you know, say six feet or 10 feet, they're all going to go dysfunctional and that none of them can be deactivated. It's, I'm just like, it's, it's kind of a cluster, wouldn't you say? Well, you know, I, I was looking into this because I got so interested that I started studying the makeshift tactic that were deployed at the Chernobyl nuclear facility. Uh, uh, in, in Ukraine, and then I was also looking at Fukushima Daiichi, the tactics that were deployed there, and then, you know, the nuclear policy here in the United States. You know, when that Hurricane Maria almost devastated Florida, the nuclear facility in Florida was still operational, like powered up, <laughs> up into the point where the hurricane actually turned. And so I asked myself, at what point does a Category 5 hurricane head toward your facility and you power down? Um, so that's one of the problems that you're talking about is, first of all, uh, are they going to power down in time? Undoubtedly. Um, secondly, what does it really mean? You, you can't submerge a nuclear uh, a, a reactor underwater, under salt water. If you do that, you're going to have a Fukushima-like situation occur. Um, all of the electrical equipment, of course, can't work under salt water. Um, and and it's it's not just, you know, in part you're right, Jennifer, to say that this will happen all at the same time. It will likely, because sea level rise isn't the same everywhere, but it would these we would start having massive problems within the same decade with a lot you of know, facilities. You know when it's going to happen, because the overall sea level rise is going to go up, and then there's going to be a storm of massive proportions, and that storm is going to create the event that could wipe out several nuclear reactors. Well, that almost happened last year, actually, here in North Carolina. So you remember Hurricane... Um, was it, Hurricane Florence was originally uh, forecast to be a Category 5 and stall over Wilmington, North Carolina, dropping over 20 feet of rain, um, or excuse me, 20 inches of rain. 
uh, uh, within just the first two days. Okay, so we're going to get multiple feet of rain, and the first day we're going to get almost two feet of rain. Um, well, if that would have happened, that would have been the scenario that you're talking about. That would have been the scenario where a Category Five parked itself over a nuclear facility uh, that was at sea level and just dropped rain for however long. Uh, that storm is predicted to stay for at least three to five days over that mm -hmm. area. Uh, luckily, the forecast changed and it moved and did some other things, but we're already in that era. So you're right to point that out, that it's it, the, the sea level rise is that long term, like in the back of your head, oh my God, this is eventually gonna happen. But then it's like, um, it's like a, a, a Russian roulette game with the hurricanes every year. <laughs> it is. It totally is. It's just like the deer hunter, you know, it, it, one, one of these days it, it gets you, you know, and so it's just a matter of time before we have a monster hurricane and it's just going to be like Fukushima times five, you know. And then what happens if you have a nuclear accident? at a time where the hurricane is stalling over the facility and you have no road access or air access to the facility to try to get operators there to manage the crisis. That's the one thing that was different in, 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 in Chernobyl is everyone had immediate access to the facility. In, 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 um, in Fukushima Daiichi is a tsunami, so the water receded. And yeah, you had to kind of climb your way through the rubble, but you could get to the facility. But a situation where the hurricane's stalling for days and feet of water surround every passable way and the winds are blowing 150 miles an hour, you're not gonna be able to get to the facility until after the storm has passed. You know? Oh my God. It, it sounds like a disaster moving on. Moving <laughs> it really does. I mean, you know. But these it's, are it's real. it's crazy. It's real. It's these real. are real. These are increasingly real possibilities, and that's what I think our audience should take home: is that these are increasingly real possibilities that our world has to deal with. We are talking about not the world as it were, but as it is climate changing, um, and we're going to have to start having these serious conversations with our communities. We're going to have to start having these serious conversations with our universities. Uh, with our politicians, um, because I do think ultimately, the more we talk about it, having this insight. So for the 23 people who are watching, I'm almost sure very few of them, maybe maybe have a smart group, uh, thought about something like that before today. So if you don't think about something, then there's no ability for you to prepare a response, okay? And so in talking about this, you know, we're passing it along. You know, that's why I say I feel good talking to, to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, because I genuinely do feel like with the way that they've been responding to this questioning, uh, that I, I might be the first civilian who's asked them questions like this. Um, and I've been assured, you know, for whatever that's worth by a, a, a Trump headed uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, that there's 11 staff members working on the questions I asked him about nuclear uh, facility safety in regards to climate change and sea level rise. Um, well, very good, Antonio. You can keep a whole team busy with your questions, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> so hopefully that has some type of reverberation effects because I mean, essentially I would say that at the very least they have to acknowledge things that I've said were factual. Uh, now how the, how the commission deals with the facts is, you know, and partly up to them. But that's where more, as more people learn about this, they can get engaged on this. And it's about doing that mobilization and building those public pressures uh, to go in an opposite direction. So I hope that everybody is has taken, you know, this talk is supposed to be a little bit humorous, uh, dead humor. It's supposed to be, you know, grimly serious because it is a wicked problem. But we're also talking about things that we can do personally, um, and, and the policies that we can kind of push for collectively to respond to the ongoing crisis. But people have to get real. You cannot, we, we sat on this from 1990 to now, we're still sitting on it as far as I can see. Uh, <laughs> however, we're not only just sitting on it, we kicked it down the road, we're calling it a lot. Um, but, but We're calling it a lie. That's the part that is so scary. So here you can hear the truth and you hear people speaking the truth about all the different interacting factors on the climate. You can't find that anywhere 
hardly, you know, certainly not on cable news, not in a consolidated format like that. So we are actually looking at this, taking it and and looking at it in, in the eye, you know, and, and, and really kind of putting it all together and, and having these important conversations about, you know, what are the consequences of this? What's going to happen? What are the feedbacks? What are the effects? What can we expect? What's going on? And I, I think that's exactly right. And it's again about ultimately building that narrative. It's about building that conversation, that dialogue that people can engage in that is real. Because ultimately, you know, CNN and MSNBC are showing a little bit more, but they're not giving you the totality of what's happening. That is going to be a responsibility of, you know, activist citizens like us. Um, and that's ultimately why we have these conversations. You know, enlighten you a little bit about what what the literature is saying on this, even though I disagree uh, with the sentiments of IPCC. Um, to talk to you about you know what what's happening in the world, um, and certainly the things that I say you can look up and see for yourselves if you're willing to go down those rabbit holes. Sometimes I want to warn people. Maybe maybe you don't want to know about about everything that's going on, um, but 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 it's there for you to have, and that's why we're having this conversation. I just want to thank everybody for joining us for this episode of Environmental Coffee House. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking with uh, our guest Jennifer Hines. Yeah, thank you. It's been good to be here. Okay. Thank you, everybody, and join us next time on another episode of Environmental Coffee House, where we'll have Mindy Duggan. She'll be talking about uh, Monsanto one of the lead corporations that affects how we do agriculture industry in the United States and around the world. Uh, not only its impacts on the climate, but its impacts on your very bodies. Thank you, I'm Antonio Reed.